it's lovely to to be with everybody and um, I'm looking forward to, to just sharing some work that we've been involved in and um, with colleagues and if I just the you can see the logos there but if I just um, sort of move on one slide these are all the, the the colleagues and some of the colleagues I know are on this are involved in this conference which is great to see them um, so I'm going to talk about the use of compositional data analysis um, using geochemical data um, and also the more recent work using air quality data and it's to explore the associations with chronic kidney disease. So I suppose, first of all, we have to think about what is in our environment. Um, and we're sort of aware now that obviously um, with um, you know, carbon footprints, we want to eat locally, we want to use more local produce, but obviously that involves obviously our produce that's, that's grown in the soil. But we're also very aware of what's happening around us in terms of air quality, the sorts of um, environmental toxins that we might be subject to as we all try and do a little bit more exercise and even within lockdown, you know, how that has impacted us. And especially as we open up a lockdown, it's, it's very clear what's happening around us. Um, so the World Health Organization has been very aware um, how, of how um, our, uh, the trace elements are, do affect our, our health. And they have defined um, elemental um, trace elements into three different categories, um, essential ones, um, ones that we're probably familiar with, such as iodine and zinc and, and selenium, uh, and even copper, molybdenum and chromium. But those are that are probably essential to our bodies, including nickel, but then also ones that are potentially toxic elements. And some of these um, we're very aware are toxic. Um, and these are particularly maybe uh, have been linked to chronic kidney disease, such as cadmium and mercury. Uh, that we'd be aware of and arsenic and lead. So I'm going to concentrate on chronic kidney disease and uh, chronic kidney disease and kidney, our kidneys are incredibly important functions within our body. They are actually the hardest working organs in our body. Um, they keep our bones healthy by balancing the levels of minerals in our body and they also remove toxic waste from our body. Um, so they are incredibly uh, busy organs and um, important organs. So it's really important to have a look at how the environment might be affecting um, our, our body in terms of our kidneys. Now, chronic kidney disease is a, um, I suppose, a collective term. Um, and we know that, you know, it basically it is progressive re renal failure and it is increasing worldwide. And that's due to aging, obesity and diabetes. Um, but there's also this part that's known as unknown, chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology, and it has been linked to environmental factors. And this is certainly of worldwide concern. And again, the World Health Organization has set up a high level um, organization and um, association to look into this. There is no definitive cause known, um, but there are uh, known nephrotoxins and the ones that have been highlighted are individual elements such as lead, cadmium, mercury, and arsenic. Um, but the link between those um, and chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology still needs to be established. But obviously anything that affects um, the unknown etiology is also very relevant to chronic kidney disease because it's irrelevant to the whole progression of our, our renal failure. And again, it might be linked to diabetes and hypertension so it's incredibly important to look into all of these different factors. So I'm going to introduce now the different data sets. And the first one is the chronic kidney disease data set. And this has been provided by the UK Renal Registry. And they have a requirement to collect data on all patients. And it's actually the data before the patients go on to renal replacement therapy. So basically before they start dialysis. Um, and they collect the data on all of these patients and they've provided the data for this study in terms of a standardized incidence rate. Um, it is collated over um, a period between 2006 and 2016 um, to avoid any small data area or issues. And they provided the data in terms of a census admin output, which is the smallest that we have available within Northern Ireland. They're equivalent to the super output areas of a local level in, in England, and they're called SOAs or super output areas. The data are also provided within age brackets. Um, so we have between 16 and 39, 40 and 64, the plus 65 year olds, 
all data uh, greater than 16 age group, and then also for this unknown etiology. And what a uh, uh, standardized incident rate really means is that the data have been looked at in terms of what would be expected for the average age, uh, age specific for a region. And so for Northern Ireland, an SIR above one means that the incidence is higher than would be expected and below one is the incidence lower than would be expected. So if we look at the maps for all of Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland is part of the UK and the northern part of Ireland. So we're in a, a unique and special uh, location. Um, so you can see that across Northern Ireland, um, just by the, the administrative, there are the super output areas. Um, and if you look at sort of about the, all of the data, which is greater, basically all data greater than 16 years, um, and as you progress through the different age brackets, you can see that it, there, it is spatially variable where these um, SOAs of an SIR, which is greater than would be expected um, for Northern Ireland. And certainly in the unknown etiology, the map for unknown etiology, you can see again that there seems to be a spatial, interesting spatial distribution. And if we look at uh, the maps for Belfast, and Belfast is the largest urban area within Northern Ireland, and, and just over about 1.3 million people um, live in Belfast, in the greater area of Belfast. And again, the maps show this spatial, um, different spatial distribution. Um, certainly for the 16 to 39, where we're certainly getting some SOAs that are showing higher than would be expected. And for the chronic kidney disease of unknown origin or unknown etiology, the SIR show up to 12 times higher than would be expected for Northern Ireland's average incident rates. So the second data set that I want to introduce is the um, deprivation measures. Um, and for Northern Ireland, uh, and I'm showing for Belfast here, we have deprivation measures, which are provided by our Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. Um, and in the, they've been divided up into 890 and sort of a, uh, units and a low, so one is the lowest. And if you um, uh, SOA that scores 890 is basically very not deprived, so very uh, less deprived. So one is the most deprived area. So in these maps, the darkest blue areas are the most deprived. And, and unfortunately they show West Belfast and really North Belfast um, as being some of the most deprived areas. Um, and the uh, overall deprivation uh, indice is broken up into six different measures um, and uh, employment and income make up 25% of the overall um, deprivation measure. So that's our second data set. The third data set is the TELUS um, data set, which is a large regional geochemical data set. And I'm showing it for, well, there's the whole of Northern Ireland, but also the one that we're gonna look at is the urban, the particular urban data set. And there's 1,000 urban samples, and they were analyzed by XRF analysis. And we do know that there is a geological variation uh, across Belfast. We have an influence of the um, paleogene basalts, the flood basalts, weathering of those, glacial weathering of those, but also some variation on metamorphic rocks um, and also some sandstones across the area. Now, the interesting thing about Belfast and many other urban cities is that it has um, seen a history of um, industrial growth. And in Northern Ireland, our industrial growth really um, coincides with the opening of Harland and Wolf, which is our, our large shipbuilding manufacturing area, um, and really develops. And you can map it into the 1858, which is really associated with the shipbuilding, and 1901, and 1919 to 1939. And these really develop and spread across Belfast. And they are linked to different types of manufacturing. So that we know that there are anthropogenic sources of things like copper, zinc, tin, antimony, and lead. And our most recent development is Belfast City Airport. And again, that's obviously another uh, potential anthropogenic uh, pollution source. So if you just look at a, a mapping of um, CKDU, and this is, is, so this is a one of unknown etiology, just across those different time zones for Belfast, you can see sort of an interesting, again, different dis, uh, uh, spatial distributions across Belfast. And again, you can see that the deeper red in this case are the, the um, SOAs, which have a standardized incident rate, which is above 
what you would expect for the average age distribution for Northern Ireland. So how do we model then the data? How do we actually look at the relationship between the different data sets? Well, um, obviously we're going to, you know, in this conference, what we're going to concentrate in is the use of um, compositional data analysis but we're dealing with several different data sets that are all compositional in their, in their different ways. So obviously the geochemical data that we have, we have a, a ranking of the deprivation indices um, uh, that we want to look at. Uh, and then we also have these standardized incidence rates um, for the chronic kidney disease. So we use a combination, um, um, uh, we've actually compared different types of log ratios. Um, so we're using particularly the isometric log, log ratio a pairwise log ratio, and we're also going to use this balance approach um, for log ratios. And then once we have opened up the data into coordinate space, then we use a number of different types of regression um, models um, to really look at the relationship and try to assess the statistical, um, whether there's any statistical um, correlation between the data sets. So the first, I suppose, um, the first type of compositional data set or analysis that I sort of want to mention is one of the balance approach that we're using. And we're using the CellBal algorithm. Um, and, and that's obviously um, introduced by Rivia and Pinto at et al. And basically this, we used it for all of our data. So integrated all of our data. And it allows us to look at the relative abundance um, that might be most closely associated with elevated incidence of chronic kidney disease. Um, and also chronic kidney disease of, of unknown etiology. And the process uses a, an NFOL cross validation procedure and basically allows us to, to identify the best balance or the balance that comes up most, so the highest frequency um, that is determined. And then a mean squared error is used to determine the number of, of components that is best used within the balance. Um, and then we can use, we can test that through different types of regression and model to see if the, if the balances are seen to be statistically significant. So the results that I'm showing are just for the chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology. And this is with all of the soil, potentially toxic elements and six um, individual domains of deprivation. Um, and the results in this case have shown that there are three most common balances and the frequencies are just shown there in the last row. Um, and uh, one of those balances, the cell bal algorithm has uh, uh, named as a global balance. But you can see that um, the different elemental compositions come up a certain um, percentage. And, and you know, nickel and uh, molybdenum, arsenic, chromium are all coming up um, at least 45 or more percent of the time. And you can see the frequency of the balances coming up as well. So balance one, nickel, and chromium and balance two molybdenum and arsenic are coming up um, with the greatest frequencies. So what do the results actually show us in terms of urbanization and our health then? Well, if we look at the overall results from this part of the analysis, we can see that they, they suggest a correlation. Um, and this is, I'm only representing the significant correlations that were shown here between all ages of CKD. So that's the data all, for all ages greater than 16, and the multiple deprivation indices of employment and income. And those, were, those are the ones that were found to be significantly, um, uh, statistically significant. Um, and the interesting thing about these MDMs or these multiple deprivation indices um, domains is that they have been used as an indication of socioeconomic factors and linked to things like smoking. So there is a health connection there. In terms of the historical um, industrial Belfast analysis, um, the most sort of the uh, largest area, obviously, is the most recent, the 1990 to 1939. So it had the most data within it. And the strongest correlation for CKDU, the unknown etiology, is with the elemental balance of copper and antimony. And again, the, these elements have been linked to industrial smelting um, of, of various um, industries. So there, there is a, a natural link there. So we're, the, the balance that are shown do make sense. And just a historical Belfast with the CKDU over. So what are the results then show for this potential link with air pollution? 
Well, for the um, sort of greater Belfast area, the strongest correlation with CKDU at this point is found with the um, sort of a balance of arsenic and molybdenum. Um, and if we just plot the road sort of network on top of the map, um, you can see that there is an interesting um, sort of a pot potential association with the road network. Um, and things like air pollution and traffic and uh, brakeware emissions have been cited as sources for these heavy metals. Um, and arsenic and molybdenum have also been linked to atmospheric pollution, um, as well as obviously pollution from traffic. And interestingly, brakeware emissions have also been linked to sources of antony and molybdenum. Um, so the uh, research into air pollution and kidney disease is very recent. Um, so th this is work ongoing. Um, and as I say, not just the work that we're doing, but other uh, in, in um, the, the field of kidney disease, they are exploring this link, this uh, potential link with air pollution. Um, but there have been studies that have shown that these ultrafine particles, um, and that does include lead, molybdenum, and atomy, can become um, blood bound. They can get into our blood streams and then translocate to other tissues, and that's including the kidney. Um, so what our study, this initial part of the study shows that there is um, evidence that these um, air pollution deposition of the modern pollutants and the graph I've just shown on the right hand side is the amount of molybdenum that is actually being developed worldwide. And this is partly in response um, to the need for brake pads. Um, and we do hope that the electric vehicles will need less of this. But at the moment, um, our, our anthropogenic source of molybdenum is actually increasing worldwide. So the results from th this part of the study show that um, urban soils can be used as a proxy for the availability of ne nephrotoxins for environmental pollution. Now, just briefly, I would like to sort of um, expand the study then onto more recent work that we've done. So obviously, the outputs of one of the uh, of the previous work, which is now being published, um, does sh indicate this potential link with pollution, air pollution. Uh, and maybe um, ground pollution such as traffic. Um, and again, there have been some um, experimental work done between looking at the link between this and chronic kidney disease. Um, obviously, there are other links with um, respiratory disease. And unfortunately, um, you know, the, the recent ruling that air pollution did contribute um, to the death of a nine-year-old nine um, in, in London is the most recent and the only ruling of actual link air pollution to, to health. Um, but, uh, but chronic kidney disease is still not completely um, confirmed. But there have been some work that's looked at air pollution and particularly the very fine particulates, um, PM 2.5 exposure. So for Northern Ireland, we have access um, to air pollution data um, that includes PM 2.5, uh, PM or nit nitrous oxide, um, different types, um, oops, sorry, and also PM2, uh, PM10. So for the this uh, final part of the study then what I, that uh, we want to introduce really is that um, to look further at the urban data sets and as a, we've already introduced the urban TELUS soil geochemical data set, um, the uh, standardized incidence rates that I mentioned earlier, the CKD um, for all of all data over 16 years, and the chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology. And we want to look at the environmental um, toxins, the air pollution, and again, link that potentially with social deprivation. So the techniques that we've used are again, the forward selection method using the cell bowel algorithm, um, a generalized linear regression, um, but also looking at the influence of spatial regression. So um, what is the impact of this potentially um, sort of spatial dependence in our data? Um, so just looking at the, the data to confirm the, the types of data we're using, we're going to, we've used 10 geochemical elements, and these again have been informed on the literature and the links with air pollution and health. Um, we imputed the geochemical data according to the um, GSNI, Geological Survey Northern Ireland requirements. And then we also use a geometric mean value for each um, PTA for each of the um, super output areas within the Greater Belfast urban area. And there are actually 265 SOAs. 
For the air pollution data, we use the 2006 data set to, quite, to try and coincide with the TELUS survey um, and the UKRR data. Um, and the air, air pollution covariates that we used um, were benzene, uh, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, sulfur dioxide, and then the particulate matter PM10 and the finer particulate matter PM2.5. And for the pollutants for SOAs with missing values, we used ordinary creaking with cubic models for imputation. So just looking very briefly, very, very briefly at the results. Um, these are the results for both chronic kidney disease for all age groups, so basically above 16 years, and also for chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology. And again, the cell bio method is very useful in that it highlights these um, uh, potential balances that we can then explore further through regression. And so for the PTEs, um, for the all ages of chronic kidney disease, molybdenum, um, uh, zinc, or again, that balance is coming out as the most frequent, so 64% of the time. And the air pollutants, um, sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide, again, a very high percentage of the time. And for the chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology, chromium and nickel, the balance between chromium and nickel, and also the air pollutants of um, PM 2.5, so the fine particulates, but also carbon monoxide. Five minutes, Jenny, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I'm, I'm just sort of finishing up. Um, so in terms of the results then, just to sort of um, uh, summarize those results. So using um, a generalized linear regression with a log link, we did find a statistically significant correlation um, between the CKD for all age groups. Again, that's basically all age groups above 16. And these, these um, uh, compositional balances of molybdenum to zinc, um, also the uh, multiple deprivation indices of employment, uh, income and health. So they were the ones that were found to be signif statistically significant using GLM. However, when we introduced a spatial lag, so use a spatial regression, the coefficients were not found to be statistically significant. Um, in terms of the um, data for the air pollutants, then uh, for chronic kidney disease, again, for all age groups above 16, um, sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide were, were found to be the most um, important. Um, and for chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology, the air pollutants of carbon monoxide again, and the fine particulates, um, PM 2.5, appeared most within the balances. Um, but the association and the air pollutants for chronic, uh, for chronic kidney disease of all known ages for of greater than 16, again, when we looked at um, a spatial regression, were not found to be statistically significant. So final thoughts then. So uh, our preliminary findings, and as we say, the, we've, we've more work to do, but the findings are very um, informative and very interesting. And they do support the argument that these atmospheric pollutions in the form of, um, from sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, and certainly the particulates PM10 and PM2.5 may um, be negatively associated with renal disease. Obviously we do need to impact, look at the impact further on, on this, um, but it does, one of the interesting aspects is that it is raising the profile of some of these anthropogenic sources such as molybdenum from, um, from brake pads um, that we need to consider. Um, and uh, the work needs to be discussed further and developed further, but um, I think compositional data analysis has shown us a very robust way to uh, analyze the data. So just finally to say thank you to our sponsors and some references, thank you.